By our attitude, we decide to read or not to read. By our attitude, we decide to try or give up. By our attitude, we blame ourselves for our failure or we blame others. Our attitude determines whether we tell the truth or lie, act or procrastinate, advance or recede. And by our own attitude, we and we alone actually decide whether to succeed or fail. With the right attitude, human beings can move mountains. With the wrong attitude, they can be crushed by the smallest grain of sand. Achievers have a can-do attitude that sets them apart from mere dreamers. Achievers are sold out to success no matter the obstacles, and they are willing to put forth the effort and pay the price of success. Attitude drives actions. Actions drive results. Results drive lifestyles. The only constant factor in life is our feelings and attitudes toward life. One of the few things that we have total control over is our own attitude. Discussing the negative isn't always pleasant, but it's necessary because it's part of life. Attitude issues are like weeds in a garden. They're a normal part of life. Remember this, negative is normal. It's not ideal, but it's part of life. In my opinion, you have to learn to handle the negative. Don't ignore it. Some may teach differently, so listen to various perspectives and make your own decision. Don't just follow, be a student. I believe you must handle the negative. You don't have to dwell on it, but you can't ignore it either. That's my view. Some may advise you to just ignore the weeds, but they'll take over your garden. So you've got to handle the negative. Part of this is what I call the great war between good and evil. Mr. Reynolds and I are working on a new book this year called The Great War Between Good and Evil. There is indeed a war from the moment you were born you became part of the struggle between good and evil, darkness and light, negative and positive, tyranny and democracy, weeds and human activity. The war is ongoing. If democracy sleeps, guess who never sleeps? Tyranny. In the absence of light, guess what's automatic? Darkness. If good does not arouse itself and become active, guess what moves in? Evil. It's a war, a mental war, a physical war, a financial war between enterprise and ease, between accomplishment and failure. It's a war. That's why there's an Old Testament phrase that gives the best advice for human activity when it says, six days labor, one day rest. Now, I'm sure we've taken that to mean, don't work all seven days, take one off. Here's what it also means, only take one off, or you're liable to lose the war. Now we've got it down to five and two, and maybe that's not too dangerous, I don't know. If God would have thought of five and two, he might have made it five and two. I don't know, you can't think of everything. But here's what it does mean. Enterprise is better than ease. If you rest too long, the jungle overtakes the village. Now here's the good news about the war between good and evil. Evil is no match for good, but good must be active. Weeds are no match for human activity, but if you stay in still, how far in will they come? All the way, they'll grow right up around your shoes. But if you get busy, how far back can you take them? As far as you wish, they are no match, but you must be active. That's why the six and one. Make sure you're not losing the war by taking off too much. Guess what the average years are after retirement? Six, which means don't retire. Your chances are too slim. The war between good and evil, the weeds. You gotta make sure you recognize the negative, handle it, deal with it, and then go on. Let's make a list of the diseases of attitude that can wreck all your chances to do well. One of the words that destroys everything is called neglect. And I found this out, a week of neglect could cost you a year of repair, is it worth it? So what to be on the lookout for? Here's the list. If you were making it, you'd have the same list I've got. We're not covering anything new tonight. This is a reminding session, not a teaching session, but it doesn't hurt to go over it again. Here's the list, attitude diseases. Number one is indifference, the shrug of the shoulder. The guy's not even concerned, he's just drifty. 
This is called the mild approach to life, a disease known as mildness. The guy says, well, I can't see getting all that worked up. Well, to be any kind of winner, you got to get worked up. There's one problem with drift. You cannot drift to the top of the mountain. And the good Lord said in the closing chapters of the Bible, here's the best way to live one way or the other. That's best. Hot or what's next best. Cold is next best to hot. Not the half-baked, middle, lukewarm, not too hot, not too cold. What a sad way to live. I think what it means is pick a direction and go with everything you got. Just pick one and go. Somebody says, yeah, but what if it's the wrong direction? You will find out quicker. It won't take you 25 years to wake up and say, oh no, I've been walking the wrong road. I told my staff the other day, next best to prosperity is adversity. If one doesn't get you, pray for the other. We all do better from one of two reasons, inspiration or desperation. And I don't wish anything bad on you tonight, but if you're not inspired, I hope a wagon comes down your rut. Whatever it takes to get you to try harder, read more, set your goals and go for it. Somebody asked me one time, what quality would I pick if I wanted to work with somebody? And you know what I picked first? Number one, strong feeling. Please, number one, give me somebody that feels strong about most anything. I don't even care, just so they believe it, even if they disagree with me. Wonderful, just so they disagree vigorously. I'm not saying it's easy to win those kind of people to your point of view, but I'd rather do that than to try to resurrect people from the did, pump them up every month, pump them up, I pass, pump. Here's the key to the good life. Learn to put everything you've got into everything you do. Whatever you are doing, pour it on. It will quickly open up into opportunity or quickly disclose to you that you ought to be doing something else. The delusion is, if I had a better job, I'd really pour it on. See, that's delusion. Wherever you are, pour it on. Don't give somebody half a job for a day's pay. Pour it on. See, that will help change your life. Get rid of this disease. Here's the next attitude, disease. Indecision, mental paralysis. The guy can't make up his mind and it becomes a disease. Pretty soon he knows he's got it. The guy says, well, I know I'm on the fence. But he says, what if I get off on the wrong side? Listen, after a while, it doesn't matter. Just get up, any side will do. A life full of adventure is a life full of many decisions. The ones that turn out to be wrong give you a better experience to make better decisions. So don't see how many decisions you can get out of. See how many you can get into. That's where the adventure is. So shake off this disease indecision. The next one is doubt. Doubt is like a plague and one of the worst is self-doubt. There are many, but that's one of the worst. The guy doubts himself, doubt if it will last that long for him, doubts if he can do that well, doubts if he can make that much, doubts if he can accomplish all that. A chronic excellent self-doubter, you can imagine what damage that does to your future. So here's the key, turn this coin over and become a believer. And there's many things to believe in. One of the majors is yourself. The understanding of self-worth is the beginning of progress. Now, if those three don't get you, this one will worry. That's a devastating disease. Worry causes health problems, social problems, personal problems, family problems. It's devastating. Worry long enough, it'll drop you to your knees. Could reduce you to begging. I know how bad this one is. I used to have it bad. I used to be known as a super warrior, not a super warrior, no super warrior. My family wished I'd have been a warrior. I got those years to make up for, but I tell you what, my advice to you is do what I finally did on worry. Give it up. Who needs it? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's worth it. It took me almost one year to kick the worry habit and it was not an easy year. It was one of the toughest years I ever spent but I finally got that monkey off my back. 
and I discovered you could live the most incredible life free of worry. Not free of challenge, not free of difficulty, free of worry. I learned how to do it, and you can. Here's the next attitude disease, overcaution. Some people never will have much. They're too cautious. Now you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens? And on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I will be in. I better not try. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life. When I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not going to get out alive. That's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go, right? That's what it's for, give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in the corner. We'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day, and we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you. We won't let anything happen to you, and you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, well, yeah. I'd live to be 100, but what a way to live, right? What a way to live safe and secure. Don't ask for security, ask for adventure. Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Here's another attitude problem, pessimism. It's about always seeing the downside, the problems, the difficulties, and finding reasons why things won't work. Pessimists live ugly lives, always looking for faults instead of virtues. They're the ones who see specks on the window instead of the sunset. They rush to point out five reasons why something won't work when one would do. For them, the glass is always half empty. Optimists, on the other hand, see the glass as half full. It's all about perspective. Our lives are shaped by how we think things are, not necessarily how they are. There's something called better thinking habits that we don't have time to discuss tonight. But one thing my mentor taught me is that poor thinking habits keep most people poor, not poor working habits. What we think about all day long shapes our lives. As the saying goes, as you think, so you become. I used to start my days reading negative news, but I learned it was poisoning my mind. What we read influences our thoughts. So it's crucial to fill our minds with positive material. I was once asked by students how to build a good life. I said it's simple, but not easy. Select the right thoughts and keep out the wrong ones. Life is a mix of sugar and poison, so we must be careful what we let in. Every day, we need to guard our minds against negative influences. We decide what goes into our mental factory because we'll have to live with the results. And finally, the last problem to mention is very brief. The last disease, but this one, is deadly. Engage in this one, indulge in it, even slightly, and you might as well forget the future because it's going to forget you, complaining, crying, whining, griping, a Bible word called murmuring. See, that will ace your future, spend five minutes complaining, and you have wasted five, and you may have begun what's known as economic cancer of the bone. Surely they will soon haul you off into a financial desert and they'll let you choke on the dust of your own regret. I hope I said that well, so you won't forget it's a deadly disease. If you don't think it's bad, ask the children of Israel of Old Testament. Typical of us all, their story just happened to get in the book. The story says, children of Israel were slaves. God performed a series of dazzling miracles and got them out, and now they're heading for the promised land. Remember the story? Heading for the promised land. Tragedy of the story. 
They never got there. Reason. From day one, they started to complain. They griped about the water. They griped about the weather. They whined and cried and griped about the food. They griped about the leadership. They whined and cried because it was too far, too cold, too hot, too difficult, too miserable. I mean, they whined and cried for years. Finally, God said, I've had it. Trip canceled or something like that. The story says they died in the desert, never got to the promised land, which I think means two things. Indulge in this long enough, you get your future cast. And I guess it also means even God himself can only take so much. Just be on the lookout of the things that can destroy all the good you start. The war is on. And this evening, tomorrow, mentally, personally, socially, economically, you got to make sure you're winning the war. And this is part of it.